Okay, hi there, and welcome to a video on the economic significance of property rights. This is a topic which cuts across both micro and macroeconomics. You can certainly, certainly use the concept of property rights in a question on environmental market failure. And uh, it's also a significant barrier to economic development, particularly in many lower and middle income countries. It's one of those synoptic concepts that's well worth having a little bit of knowledge about and a couple of topical examples. So what are property rights? Well, they are legal rights, which are anything which confers legal control or ownership of a good. It could be land or it could be an idea. You could patent your idea, a commercial process, for example, or a new invention. And that would be a protection of your intellectual property. Now, most economists agree that for markets to operate efficiently and to avoid instances of market failure, then property rights have to be clearly defined and protected. That's one of the key jobs for any government, even in a free market economic system. Indeed, the absence of or the partial absence of property rights uh, can be and is a major cause of underdevelopment. Typically, Governments, both nationally and internationally, can protect property rights through law, through legislation, enforcing the rule of law in the courts and possibly investing in titling. Titling is when you identify who owns which land through some sort of process of land assignment or titling process. The Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto is a free market economist who has championed the need to protect property rights. In his famous book, The Mystery of Capital, he argued that the poor had plenty of capital, including their own enthusiasm and innovation and ideas, but the lack of property rights meant that it was unusable. There's a very famous quote from De Soto, without formal property, no matter how many assets the excluded accumulate or how hard they work, most people will not be able to prosper in a capitalist society. They will continue to be beyond the range of policymakers, of the reach of official records, and thus economically invisible. So Hernando de Soto was making the case for the state to be a rigorous enforcer of and protector of property rights. Essentially, if you like, uh, the argument that privatisation should be at the forefront of development policy. So why are property rights significant? Uh, let me give you a few thoughts about the significance of property rights for development, in particular from the perspective of land reform. At the moment, many African countries are using land reform as a pivotal, if you like, supply side policy to try to drive growth and investment. So what's the significance of land reform for growth and human development? Well, first of all, protected rights. If people have their land protected. That tends to be a stimulant to investment. If you own your farm, if you own the land on which you grow and extract your crops, then you have an incentive to invest in appropriate technology, such as machinery and irrigation systems, etc. Now that's crucial if you want to improve the yield or the productivity in the agricultural sector. And of course, an increase in yield and productivity can lift per capita incomes and thereby uh, therefore uh, reduce extreme poverty. Once governments know who owns the land, then the government can generate land taxes to invest in social infrastructure. One of the features in many lower and middle income countries is that total taxation as a share of GDP is extremely low compared to advanced industrialised countries. Well, part of the solution is to assign land ownership so that those who own the land can pay taxes. Uh, we'll come back to this third point in a second or two, but secure rights can help protect the environment. So property rights can be important in the battle against environmental market failure of different types. For example, property rights could be used to fight deforestation. Secure land rights are also essential for urban development. Uh, they are seen as significant in the growth of cities. No country in the world has grown rich without urbanising first. People with land ownership, in theory, can borrow against their property, so they can use the land they own uh, as collateral to take out a loan and therefore create more capital. 
and governments knowing who owns the land and where people live can make the distribution of public services much more cost effective. A crucial development point this year, I think in 2019, it's almost like a theme that will be running through many of the questions, is that of gender empowerment and tackling gender discrimination. Many women across the world continue to be denied basic land rights. So land reform which tackles gender discrimination is clearly an important aspect. And if you take away from land a little bit towards ideas, towards research and development and innovation, property rights help protect the intellectual property and the potential rewards from research and innovation. For countries, as well as communities, that's an important source of competitive advantage. So I think land reform and property rights are hugely important. Let me turn to a really significant microeconomic issue, which I hope many of you will be familiar with. It's called the tragedy of the commons, and it's one of the best examples you can find of pretty systemic environmental market failure. So the tragedy of the commons happens when nobody owns a resource. We call these common pool resources, uh, grazing land, fish stocks, forestry, and, and other aspects. So when no one owns a resource, it can get overused. Typically, people use and benefit from a common pool resource, such as grazing land. They have their own cost, and they have their own benefit, but the benefit minus the cost is pretty high for them. And as a result, what's true for one person is true for all, and people overuse a common pool resource. That overuse of what in theory should be a renewable resource can lead to a long-term decline in the maximum sustainable yield of the resource. In other words, natural capital depletes. A really good example is overfishing in areas where fishing grounds are already poorly protected. So the tragedy of the commons is essentially a property rights issue, but also it's to do with the self-interest of individuals, not necessarily thinking about the common good, the social cost and the social benefits. And the tragedy of the commons uh, is a clearly a major environmental market failure. Who knows, the examiners may well choose such an issue, deforestation, fish stocks, um, the, the, the over, overuse of common land. I've mentioned Hernando de Soto. I cannot go through this video without mentioning one of my economic heroes, Eleanor Ostrom. Eleanor Ostrom sadly died a few years ago. She made an absolutely huge contribution to our understanding of how to overcome the tragedy of the commons. She focused on the role of social capital to protect natural capital. And she studied in the field from the lobster fisheries in Maine in the United States to the pastures up in the, up in the high ground in Italy. She studied self-governance within communities and the power of social norms of behaviour, of proper conduct, voluntary, mutually agreed rules and penalties, oftentimes handed down from generation to generation. In many ways, she is a good example, her work is a terrific example of how governments don't necessarily have to intervene in markets. Sometimes communities, together, community action, can help to resolve a fundamental environmental market failure. And her work demonstrates and demonstrated how common property could be successfully managed by groups using it, and using it sustainably as well as profitably. That work won her the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2010. If you get a question on environmental market failure and the tragedy of the commons, it is fantastic to mention the work of Eleanor Ostrom, the only woman so far in 2019 to have won the Nobel Prize in Economics. So property rights issues are highly topical. They're key at both a micro and a macro level. So uh, ranging from preventing the tragedy of the commons and deforestation to the best ways to protect poaching in African game reserves, the rights of people in different societies to, to start and own and benefit from a business. In India, Modi's investment and in many other countries as well to pursue digital identity programs, to give people digital identities so that you can start to allocate government services more easily. The quote there on the left hand side from the World Bank Land and housing are the most important assets for many people, but only 30% of the world's population, less than one person in three, 
has a legally registered title to the land. There is clearly a huge amount left to do in terms of developing property rights in, across the world, but particularly in emerging and developing countries. Here we go, here's a topic then, property rights, hugely important from both a micro and a macro perspective. And I hope you found this video useful. So thank you.